welcome to the AI Minds podcast. This is a podcast where we explore the companies of tomorrow built AI first. I am your host, as always, Dimitri Ose, and this episode is brought to you by DeepGram, the number one text-to-speech and speech-to-text API on the internet, trusted by the world's top conversational AI leaders startups and enterprises like Spotify, Twilio, NASA, and Citibank. Today, we're joined by none other than Abik, the co-founder and CEO of Note. What's going on, dude? How you doing? Doing well. Doing well. How are you? Yeah, well, I'm excited to talk to you because of the explosive growth that Note has seen. I want to get all into your story. I know you decided to start Note in high school. Can you walk me through the inception of the tool and being at such a young age, like deciding to go on the entrepreneurial path? Yeah, definitely. Uh, I have always kind of been obsessed with tech. Um, I stood in line for the first iPhone. I dragged my parents to it. Um, Even though it wasn't for myself, like I wasn't buying it. It definitely wasn't getting it. Um, I've I've always loved tech. Uh, It's kind of where I've been at. Um, but the start of no is actually one that's pretty crazy and it's like a long journey. Um, I actually, uh, had taken my computer science class requirements, like, well, not requirement, but like it was, it was something I wanted to do. I had taken a little bit earlier, so I'd taken it in my sophomore year. So I had been really sort of close friends with the computer science teacher. Um, I would stop by his class, uh, pretty often here and there because I just love talking about all that stuff. Um, and so in senior year, I actually ended up in this class um, because I was trying to start a, sort of a startup that would uh, take pictures of like multiple choice, like Scantron tests. I'm not sure if like anybody remembers, but they would like fill out the bubbles and so it grade the, the test with your phone rather than buying like an expensive machine. Um, so I had, had that idea and I found somebody in that computer science class. His name was Dan, uh, really, really smart. Um, and our computer science teacher said, hey, maybe you guys should work together. And so we started working on um, this grading app. Uh, we found a few friends uh, that wanted to help us and we got a team together. We'd meet you know, at the library. Um, and that's sort of the first kind of thing that we did. Um, it never got off the ground. We never built it because Dan was working on a different app, um, which at the time was also still called Note. Uh, it was basically a text box on an Android app um, that would turn your text into like these multiple choice questions. Um, at that time, uh, I was a horrible studier. Like I could not study for the life of me. Like I spent a lot of my time creating these like handcrafted notes. I'd share them with my friends, but at the end of the day, I would do so bad on all of the different tests. Um, it had gotten to a point where like being in a sort of Indian family, like my dad was sending me a bunch of articles about how to study better. He'd be like, Hey, um, you know, you should do a bunch of these practice questions. That's the only way you could do better. Um, and so I was kind of adjusting my study, studying strategy, but I wasn't really, uh, I was kind of just going at it. And then I saw this and I was like, wait, I mean, this works really well. If I could just type in my notes or just take a picture of my notes and it creates questions for me, um, that's insane. Right. And at this time, this is, we're talking 2016 for context, like there's no chat GPT. We're like seven years away or like what, six years away from that. Um, so this was basically like magic to me. And when I saw that, I knew that, you know, every student had this, um, this could be really helpful uh, because a lot of students spend a lot of time creating notes, creating flashcards, but they're not interacting with material. Yeah. Um, and so that's really where it got started. Um, you were scratching your own itch in a way. Yeah, exactly. And was that first exactly. iteration of the note that you uh, planned on doing where you would take pictures of a test and then it would automatically grade it, there had to be some kind of photo recognition software or potentially machine learning back in those days. So I'm wondering how a few high schoolers were diving into some object detection or machine learning yeah. in 2016. Yeah. I mean, luckily, there's a lot of APIs that people had created. So I think Google had come out with some OCR at that time. Like it was it was brand new. So they had come out with OCR at that time. And 
we were trying to use that, so it was a little bit uh, more challenging for the grading one. Honestly, we didn't really dive into it too much there, uh, but where we were using it for no, it was a much easier sort of application of the API. So luckily that was, that part was handled, uh, but Dan had built like the original models to take that, whatever you scanned and uh, make it into questions. So yeah, for him to be a junior and uh, create those models, I thought was absolutely insane. Um, and we pretty much hit it off. And I think uh, from there, I kind of just took kind of control of making the iOS app, but yeah, he w sort of made these models on his own. And yeah, like we're saying, six years before chat GPT, absolutely crazy. Well, it just hits home that idea of how something or a product can be very, very cool and technically deep, but if it's not really solving a pain point for users, it doesn't make that much of a difference, does it? No, no. I think, uh, yeah, at that time it was just something, I guess, he was kind of having in his own, like, it, it was a, it was basically a project at that time and it wasn't really being applied. Um, and even um, the API, right, it was, it was out there for anybody to kind of use, but, you know, it depends on how you use it. Um, so we were able to find, like, legs for that pretty quickly and then get it into the iOS app and sort of get the ball moving and yeah, I mean, when when we first showed it to everybody, it was like, you know, pretty amazing for them to see, you know, getting a test instantly created from whatever they were putting in. Oh, sure. um, so that, you know, wow factor was, I think, enough of a motivator to be like, hey, I think we have something uh, special here. But obviously, you know, our journey was so much longer than we uh, anticipated s since 2016. And so you didn't like studying, did having this app and this new companion help you with the studying? Could you write your dad back and say, I got it all covered now, stop sending me these articles? Yeah, so I, unfortunately, like by the time we launched it, I had graduated from high school. So I w wasn't able to use it in high school, but I started at Rutgers that year um, and I did start using it for like my econ classes um, and I, for the first time ever actually did better in school. Um, <laughs> and, and I don't know if it was just the app because at the time it was like pretty like early on, but maybe it was just being involved in like learning better and, and finding a way to help other people that was just kind of motivating me to also study better and find those tips. But yeah, it, it changed the game for me uh, at that time, but much better in college than high school. And so you had a bit more of a journey with, Dan and him splitting off. You wanted to continue using it. You had amassed a bit of a user base, right? But nothing like it is today. So can you explain how that transpired? Yeah, yeah. So throughout college, we were sort of working on it. It was more on and off because, I mean, going into college for the first time and kind of, um, you know, you have a bunch of different classes, you have a bunch of free time. So it was, it was, you, I was able to work on it a lot more. Um, and Dan was actually two years younger. Um, I mean, it still is two years younger. Um, and he's still working on, uh, he was still working on it with me at that time. But we had like maybe what, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 people using it. It was nothing really spectacular. Um, we were still motivated, uh, but it was more so just like kind of like a project at that time. Um, it wasn't until like after college, um, that I kind of realized I didn't really enjoy kind of working in a corporate world. Like I wanted to create my own thing and I, did you I really get a job? still, you got I, a corporate I did. job. Oh, I did get it. So I did an internship at Intel, uh, oh. my junior year or sophomore year summer. Um, and that I, was enough. yeah, that was enough. Like I, I like Intel. I love Intel. No, I hate against Intel. It was great. It was a great experience, but I realized at that time that, if I wanted to be happy and uh, like I, for me, it was about building new things and, and, to, and, and seeing how people reacted with it. Like that was like, I was a hundred percent sure about that. And that's really where the drive kind of took in to say like, Hey, I don't want this to just be like a project. I want this to be a company. Um, and so that's really where things started to pick up in a sort of company format. In senior year, I was talking to uh, investors uh, in my dorm um, trying to raise some money to get this off the ground because at this time we were you know, sort of bootstrapping. We managed to get a check of 
$25,000 from like a, a Turkish investor by the name of Starter Sub. Um, and they kind of got us the motivation of like building this into a business and they gave us a little bit of tips and tricks there. Um, and then by uh, 2019, we registered as a company. Um, so this is a junior year of my college. Uh, 2020, I graduated. Then the world changed with COVID. Yep. And actually, it was a pretty big, uh, thing for us because education now moved completely online, right? So um, once that happened, everybody was looking for a tool uh, uh, to use this in the classroom. Um, and uh, we had this AI. And at that time, like I said, there there's nobody applying AI in this way that we're applying it. So teachers were messaging us, hey, can you build something where I can put in um, my PowerPoints and, you know, you know, get a get a quiz to give to my students, right? So the requests that started piling in, we were starting to get movement. But honestly, uh, you know, for us, it didn't really change too much. We got up to 18,000 people, which at that time was a huge mountain. Like we go, go from 2,000 to about 18,000 because of COVID. Um, but yeah, up until 2022, basically... That's about the movement we've seen. Um, and then now, I mean, we're talking about a whole different league. Uh, from 2022 to now uh, mid-2024, uh, we went from 18,000 to 1.8 million uh, oh, yeah. users. So it's uh, yeah, we're operating in a different sort of realm, uh, but it's it's been great. And yeah, Dan, you know, had, you know, another job opportunity that he left for. Um, he went to Intel? It, no, he didn't go to Intel. Uh, I think he went to a hedge fund, Citadel, I think in around 2021 or maybe early 2022. Um, so he left right before this, you know, went kind Closure. of bananas for us. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. What was the time, catalyst that yeah, um, made it shoot up like that? Because I'm sure there's plenty of people out there that are thinking, I would love to have 18,000 people using my tool and that when you're at 18,000 it's like yeah this is not a little there's a lot of people if you get 18,000 people into a building that fills it up and so it's got to be a big building but there was obviously something that you did that made it just go vertical what was it yeah for us um so at this time we had found a new sort of co-founder, Abi. Um, he's our CTO right now. So he he had been working with us throughout Rutgers as well. Um, but we had sort of this idea of like, hey, uh, people love going uh, from notes to practice questions. Um, but what if we could go from notes to flashcards? So we had been speaking to these 18,000 people. And like you said, 18,000 is like now a small amount. But at that time for us, like, it was so precious, right? We were, we were talking to them and we were like, you know, what can we do better? Like, how can we get this to more people? Like, um, and so they were telling us, hey, I use flashcards all the time. I use uh, sites like Quizlet, I use Anki, Brainscape. Like, I use flashcards. So can you apply this AI to flashcards? And that's exactly kind of what we did. Um, but on top of that, and this was sort of the, the crucial point, um, at this time, like I said, AI is not really a huge thing. So not everybody is like on board with the idea of AI. It, it's it's also not like performing that great. So like you're putting in text and it's creating flashcards, but they're not like high quality flashcards that people are probably used to seeing now at this point. Um, so there was definitely improvements needed in technology. Um, and so at that time, we decided to add a feature where you could just create flashcards separately. Um, and then one of our biggest competitors sort of started charging for their platform um uh, it was quizlet um and uh, and then we said okay well we don't need to charge for this i mean there's there's no reason that this feature should be paid uh -huh. um and we started offering it for free um and i guess from a tech side from a product side that was the spark um but i mean the main sort of uh i think unique factor that we have in Note is definitely our marketing capabilities. We were able to connect with the audience extremely well. And, it, and it's, it's, it's most likely because we were students, right? Like we were students building a product for students. It was not something that we had to guess like, hey, what do other students like? What do other students not like? We, we knew, yeah, right? What do they so, do in their free time? Where do they go? All that stuff. Yeah. 
Exactly. So actually, one of our friends, one of my friends from high school, uh, so actually, my co- one of my cousin's friends from high school, uh, uh, Ramya, she's our CMO now. Uh, she joined our team around then. Um, and she has her own sort of food blog. If you guys may know, it's it's called Eats by Ramya. So she has like, I think now she has over close to half a million followers across her Instagram and TikTok on her sort of food account. So she had been doing this for a little bit up until then. And we said, hey, Ramya, you know, we want to kind of show the world about Note. Um, and we started working uh, together. And at that time, so like I said, August, up until August of 2022, for context, we had 18,000 people. In September, we put out a TikTok um, that got 6 million views. Didn't pay for this. Um, it, it just went out. I was at a wedding at the time. And I was literally seeing our phone blow up. Um, And then at the end of September, like fast forward to the end of September, we had 100,000 people using the site, right? So from 18,000 to 100,000, we're talking about uh, an absolute uh, immense jump for us. Um, And it was getting to a point where, you know, a month later uh, in October, we were at 200,000. And then I was like, okay, like I'm getting emails like basically every two hours, like, hey, there's this issue, there's this issue. Can you fix this? How do I do this? And I was like, like my job had become basically replying to like emails. Yeah, support. Um, so that growth was was really good. And yeah, I mean, marketing has been our huge sort of- um, What was it? Just sending TikToks? And uh, just for context, or by the yeah. way, I've seen you all pop up on my feed and I got oh, so wow. stoked when I did because I knew you were in the startup program Yeah, and I was so excited. It was like, wow, look at that. You all are killing it. Like my random feed, I have no reason to be seeing this, but I am. And so I just remember, it was almost like a how-to video or it wasn't a how-to video. There was a great hook to it. And I remember it was like, oh yeah, I could see why this would blow up, but what were the things that you specifically did to make sure that it had that virality? And was it only through viral growth? Is that really what yeah. it was? Yeah. I mean, so far, like just to give, you know, a precedent, um, we had spent, so we have spent over like close to very under $20,000 in about the last one and a half years to get to 1.8 million users, right? For most companies, that's their monthly budget. Like that's what they're spending monthly. Um, yeah, and they're more. not seeing the growth. Yeah. Even so, if, you, if you add up all the cost of personnel too, it's way more. Yeah, yeah. At that time, we were just bootstrapping it. We were putting out the TikToks. We, we, we kind of had this, I, I would say, obsessive nature to TikTok. Like it was like we were looking at the numbers and we were like, okay, this hook is losing people. This hook is losing people. And we obsessed over like the first three seconds because that's usually what most of the audience is watching. Um, but at that time for us, we we kind of learned a few tips and tricks about like, hey, it's not always about sort of shoving your product down people's throats. Like that's not what every big company does. They they build a brand. So they they promote other things in that ecosystem that that people in that audience would like. And then eventually you sort of, you know, get more of a bigger audience. So I think right now on TikTok, we're sitting at a little shy of 200,000 followers. And Instagram, I think a little bit shy of 100,000. And and what's crazy is if you look at the big brands in this space, they're around the same number. And they've spent probably 100 to 200, 300 times, maybe more. Um, but yeah, for us, it was obsessing over the hooks. Um, and it was building relatable content. So even if you go on uh, our TikTok right now, you're going to see some absolutely crazy things. Like we just had a post about uh, the Olympics and there was like a bunch of like uh, uh, crazy things that led up to the Olympics. Like there was this uh, scandal about like pooping, like people pooping in the sea, is the Seine River. The river, yeah. Yeah. So we are, we've become sort of this like, I wouldn't say like news news agency or like news delivery method, but like we started connecting with the audience in such a proper way at this point where people are following us, not just because we're a study account, it's because, you know, we resonate really well with that audience. So yeah, now, you know, that's kind of the brand we've built. And I mean, it's all props to Ramya and her team, 
in, in what she's been able to accomplish with such little sort of uh, like sourcing of money there. Um, but yeah, we, we that's definitely a sort of our Trojan horse in, in growing uh, this large. And so after you raised that initial 25K check from the Turkish fund, you didn't go yeah. out and raise more once you saw you're growing like crazy, you need to scale. Yeah. I imagine server costs are starting to rack up. Everything yeah. is, is kind of racking up. Yeah, yeah. So uh, what basically kind of allowed us to do this transition in the first place was uh, a check from Mucker Capital. So we got it around, I think, end of 2021, like tail end of 2021. We're talking 2022 until like the money hit. Um, and that's what allowed us to kind of make this transition. We still were, it was like 100 and what, maybe 25K or 150K. Um, so it wasn't like a crazy amount. Like it's like if you wanted to pay yourself that, like you basically had no money. So we weren't taking any money out of it. Um, so it just got us to sort of that transition. But what was great was Mucker is this kind of everybody hears about YC, but I think Mucker is like one of the most underrated funds because YC kind of works with you for about like two to three months, and then they kind of send you uh, off to defend yeah. for yourself. But Mucker has worked with me up until um we raised like our seed round this this year which was about or sorry last year which was about like two million um but that like they worked with me up until then um and so for them for the most part um that was you know kind of the the catalyst for that transition um and then like i said we we had the next round of funding but you know we never had an excessive amount of funds like uh, the the whole basis of the company is about saving money and doing things scalably like even now we don't spend a lot you know every month um but that that's kind of what allowed us to get there and i have an interesting sort of story that i'm sure a lot of other founders can relate to but hopefully they can't um but in the end of 2022 that as you can imagine that 125 grand kind of went dry because our server costs were insane. Like our AWS bill in October was like $30,000, right? And at that point, you know, if you get a bill of $30,000, you're lasting four months, right? And we had already spent a lot of money by then too. Um, so at that point, I had about, I'd say, close to 130000 saved up, you know, from working, you know, um, and I started paying the bills uh, out of pocket uh, for the next, say, six, seven months. Uh, I lived at home and I paid those bills for six or seven months um, until we could get our next round of funding uh, because nobody, and the market had gone to absolute uh, yeah. shit at that point. 2022, um, yeah, of course. Nobody yeah. wanted to fund anything. It was the. Yep. And oh, oh. it was crazy because I, I remember I was like, we got 200,000 people in two months. Like, I'm sure somebody's going to want a piece of this, right? And soon we were at 500,000, soon we were at 600,000, 700,000, and nobody was willing to write a check. Wow. Um, so, yeah, I just kept, uh, de like, using the money that I had saved up and taking that gamble. And then, uh, luckily, it has sort of paid off in, in one sense, and we'll see if it pays off later, but... Yeah, at that time, super tough. Uh, you know, wouldn't recommend to anybody at that point. But uh, we've had a, a crazy journey, I'd say, in the last two, one and a half years because of that. And so, as you look ahead in the future, what are you thinking about for Note? How is it going to evolve, or or, or continue to do what you're doing best? Are you gonna do what your competitor did and just start charging <laughs> for the product now, yeah. and then create a competitor? that will come, crop up yeah yeah i think um for me the biggest thing i've learned throughout this journey so far and I, I know i have such a long journey ahead but the biggest thing i've learned is that if you build a really good product eventually people will come um obviously they won't come by themselves you need good marketing you need you know the good things but uh, at this point note has those pieces and i i can like sort of go off and sort of lean on that and for us, we want to continue to build a great product. And I think education is one of those places that's sort of ripe for disruption because I think a lot of people don't put much money into it. Now, now people are putting more money into it because of the sort of 
um, forthcoming of AI, like an AI has become like a big thing now, um, but people weren't really investing in it before. So my dream for no, for the last, you know, three, four years has been making or being sort of a disruptor in the space, right? I, I want to continue to disrupt every single company that's ever been in this space um, and continue to sort of challenge the values that they've kind of put in. Because if you look at some of our competitors, they've stayed the same since I was in middle school. Like they, they look the same, they work the same. Maybe they have a little more bells and whistles here and there, but they're not really changing a lot of things. So for no, my vision is to make this sort of the all-in-one learning tool um, for students uh, and now for teachers. Um, so we, we just launched something for teachers at the end of uh, 2024, uh, like the, the school year. Um, and now we want to make this sort of that all-in-one tool where not only are the students who are studying here, but the teachers can come where students are studying and deliver content to them that they feel is necessary um, and build off of what their students are already doing. Um, so I think there's a huge sort of potential there. Um, and as for charging, I think we're going to be a lot more smart uh, about that. Uh, I think for us, we have understood where there's sort of a willingness to pay and where there isn't. Um, and for us, it's about, I, I feel like when you're in that position where you can say that you're, you want to disrupt businesses, you're never going to be sort of like sitting back and charging for things that you've already built. Cause that's what these comp competitors do, right? They, they sort of charge for the features that have been there for the last 10 years. And then that upsets people because they're like, Hey, this was free. Like three years ago. I, yeah. I mean, I, I used this like two weeks ago and, and now you're charging me for it. It's, so that part, I think, is what upsets people. And for us, I don't think that will be a problem because we don't like to sit still. We like to make new things, even if it comes at the expense of what we've built. And I think that's one of our biggest strengths like that we've built into the, the culture is like, it doesn't matter if we spent two years building something. If we can recreate something in the next three months that will be better than that, we will do it. Like, we don't care. Like... Uh, for us, that's like the biggest thing. So that's kind of the vision. Um, that's our understanding. So um, if a new company does come, uh, I think we will want to instruct them too. So I, I think that's that's ingrained in our DNA. So it's a, it's a big part of us. Well, Abhi, this has been a pleasure talking to you, man. I'm so excited for your success and I wish you continued growth, success. For anybody out there that is listening, that is note. K-N-O-W-T. And I encourage everyone to check it out. It's been fascinating hearing your story and hearing the drive and determination behind it. Yeah, no, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Uh, this is actually my second podcast. Uh, I only did a podcast in college. I don't, it was just with another student too. So this is like first official one. So it's, it's great to kind of have that honor, uh, here and, uh, um, yeah, I'm looking forward to everybody listening to our story because we don't really go out on social media and share too much about it. So um, thank you for, for having me and, and for the wonderful questions. I don't know how I feel about being called official, but I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> we'll end it there.